Thrill Seekers, and that was Zero Defects, uh, circa 1982 or 83, doing our big hit song, Drop the A-Bomb on Me, and that's what today's video is about. I recently watched the movie Oppenheimer. Uh, I know everybody else watched it a year ago, but I finally watched it about uh, uh, sometime last week. And for those of you who've been hiding under a rock and have no idea what that movie is about, it's about J. Robert Oppenheimer, who was one of the people who invented the atomic bomb, the first atomic bomb. And in the movie, there's a scene, which is a scene that I'd known about. I mean, I knew that this happened for a long time. But he's watching the first test of their very first atomic bomb. And after it goes off successfully, boo, uh, he says, I have become death, destroyer of worlds. And that is a quote from the Bhagavad Gita. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita, in case you don't know what the Bhagavad Gita is, it is uh, probably the most popular holy book among the the Hindus in in India, and it's a it's a section of a much larger work called the Mahabharata, which is a epic sort of I guess they call it a poem because it's a, it's done in verse and it's this whole great big story that I've never read. I've read the Bhagavad Gita, but I've never read the Mahabharata in, in total. Uh, and it's actually a rather short book. But first, before I get into that, let me show you my collection of Bhagavad Gitas. This shows you that I'm a nerd. Uh, this is, uh, I brought these down from upstairs. This is my uh, Bhagavad Gita collection. This is the one I've had the longest. This is uh, the Hare Krishna version of the Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavad Gita as it is, and I probably picked this up when I lived in Chicago, and I used to go the, right down the street. Their, uh, their temple was like two blocks away from where I lived, and I used to go there for their Sunday feasts, vegetarian feasts that they do every Sunday. And this, this one I like because it looks like a little fake Bible, and it's, it's fake leather bound. The Hare Krishnas would never use real leather on the Bhagavad Gita, but I found to my surprise, I was just kind of researching it this morning, I went on eBay trying to see how many you know Bhagavad versions of the Bhagavad Gita were for sale there, and a lot of the older ones are actually leather bound, which is funny, because if you know anything about Hinduism, uh, well this, I don't know how much is, is actually in this book about protecting cows and vegetarianism, I'm not, I think there is a, there is a, a couple lines about vegetarianism, nothing specifically about cows, but I mean cows are sacred. The whole thing's about sacred cows, so uh, making a leather-bound Bhagavad Gita seems a little weird, but there's a lot of them out there. This is another version of the same book. It's, it's the again, the Hare Krishna version, but I, I liked it because it's, it's a reprint of the one they actually came out with in the 60s. This is probably the one George Harrison owned. I mean, not this particular book, but this is probably the, the, a reproduction of the same version George Harrison would have owned back then. Uh, this is a more uh, standard version. This is the Penguin Classics edition, translated by Juan Mascaro, who was a, uh, I guess he was a, 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 a Sanskrit scholar of some note. I don't know much about him, but he, he did some other translations, old books. This one's another uh, old one. This is the Song of God, Bhagavad Gita, Peng uh, sorry, Mentor Classics. This is translated by... Uh, Swabi, Swami Prabhavananda and Christopher Isherwood, I believe. Yeah, that's right. Prabhavananda and Christopher Isherwood. With an introduction by Aldous Huxley, of all people. 
This one's neat. This is a uh, this is the Ramesh Balsakar version. Ramesh Balsakar was a student of Nisargadatta Maharaj, and it doesn't contain the entire Bhagavad Gita, but it does contain his favorite uh, quotes from it and then um, his commentary on them. And I, I think I mentioned this. I've, this is the second version of this video I did, so I'm not sure if I, I said this. In but the Bhagavad Gita is actually rather uh, short. It's it's. It's an excerpt, as I said, of the Mahabharata, but it is um, it itself is short. But a lot of people who translate the Bhagavad Gita kind of uh, swell up the page count by adding a lot of commentary and stuff. That's how the Hare Krishna version ends up being like the size of a Bible. And here's the winner for big versions of the Bhagavad Gita, as far as I've I've seen. I, I think there might even be. Uh, bigger versions, but you know, from this little tiny book, this guy made it. Uh, I don't know how many pages or thousand pages. Seventeen hundred pages. Wow. Uh, here's a more uh, scholarly version of the Bhagavad Gita. I picked this up only about a year ago. I haven't really dived into it, but I kind of wanted to have it on hand. This one's kind of fascinating. It's been at least fifteen years since I read this, so don't ask me for details. But it's called Early Buddhism and the Bhagavad Gita, and the a, a lot of people will claim that the Bhagavad Gita was five thousand years old. The Hare Krishnas are especially big on claiming that, uh, and it's possible that the earliest iterations of what became the Bhagavad Gita date back a long time, maybe not quite five thousand years. But uh, there is considerable scholarly agreement that what we have now as the Bhagavad Gita has undergone a lot lot of uh, revisions and, and things, and that some of these revisions, uh, uh, many scholars claim, were done because of the popularity of Buddhism. So there was an original version of the Bhagavad Gita, and then after Buddhism became very popular in India, the, the sort of the people who were promoting sort of Bhagavad Gita and Hinduism wanted to align their stuff a little bit more with Buddhism, and this guy, this author, uh, it, tracks some of what he says are the Buddhist influences in the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, and then uh, this is the, the other one. This was kind of interesting. This guy, uh, Quest for the Original Gita, this is sort of related to that other book where the, uh, the guy, what's his name? Uh, G.S. Kerr, I guess that's how you say it. Uh, he he tracks the different uh, the origins of the Bhagavad Gita and the different iterations. And again, this is the one I read like 15 or 20 years ago, so I don't remember all that's in there. But I, I think he basically says there's like three major uh, transformations of the Bhagavad Gita over the course of, of its long history. Now, that quote from... Robert J. Oppenheimer, I have become death destroyer of worlds, is wrong. <laughs> I, I, uh, it's, been, it's been a long time since I've looked at the Bhagavad Gita, so I, I didn't remember that it was, it, it's actually a misquote. And I'll give you some different versions of, of that. Uh, it's, it's chapter 11, verse 32, if you want to go look it up it yourself. Here is the version from uh, Song of God, Bhagavad Gita. Their version is, I am come as time the waster of the peoples, ready for that hour that ripens to their ruin. Uh, this one, um, Penguin Classics, Juan Mascaro version has, I am all-powerful time which destroys all things, and I have come here to slay these men. Even if thou dost not fight, all the warriors facing thee shall die. And the Hare Krishna version said, uh, says, The blessed Lord said, Time I am, a destroyer of the worlds, and I have come to engage all people. Uh, and so forth and so on. So the uh, the scene in which the, the this uh, quote appears is one of my favorite scenes in the Bhagavad Gita. And it's chapter 11 where... Krishna shows his universal form. So, let me give you the, the story of the Bhagavad Gita in short. The story of the Bhagavad Gita is that Arjuna is this archer who is the leader of one clan. I've forgotten, I'm, I've forgotten the names of the clans, I'm sorry. And he's facing off against this rival clan, but they're, they're a family, so they're all related to each other. And the battle is about to begin, and... Arjuna's charioteer is Krishna. 
And unbeknownst to Arjuna, Krishna is actually an incarnation of God. And at, at, in chapter 11, uh, Krishna shows Arjuna his universal form, his, his full uh, form as God himself. And I'll show you that. That's kind of, it it's often appears as an illustration in different versions of Bhagavad Gita. Here's the one from the, the Hare Krishnas where he's seeing the universal form of Krishna as God. And then, of course, one of my favorite uh, iterations of this is the cover of Axis Bold as Love by uh, the Jimi Hendrix experience, where they took a... I'm not sure who did this painting. One Hare Krishna guy I met said it was a member of the Hare Krishnas who did this painting and that uh, they subsequently repudiated him and kicked him out because he did this. But uh, basically they've substituted Krishna, uh, they put, put uh, Jimi Hendrix's head where Krishna's head should have been, and then I'm not sure who the other two uh, members of the experience are replacing. But this is also a similar uh, vision of the universal form. And you can see, uh, let's see, where is he? Arjuna down there. Uh, witnessing the universal form of Krishna. He's, he appears at the bottom um, there. And so that's, uh, that's uh, so next time you see this at a used record store, you'll know where that comes from. Good album, too. One of my favorite Jimi Hendrix albums. Kind of overlooked. You know, people know uh, uh, Are You Experienced and Electric Ladyland better than this, but I think this one is really good, too. And one of the things I remember about uh, this is talking to my first Zen teacher, who was also kind of a fan of, of Hindu literature, and he said that Krishna reminds him of Popeye, <laughs> which I was like, oh, how is that? And, and since uh, Tim and I were both cartoon and comic book nerds, we both knew the story of Popeye, so he knew he could explain this to me. It, it, Popeye, the sailor man, famous cartoon character, actually starts off in a comic strip called Thimble Theater, and he's just a one-off character who's supposed to, he was supposed to appear in a few, this was, this was a comic book before it was a, a cartoon, and or not a comic book, a newspaper comic. And he was just supposed to appear in a few episodes, but he was so popular that uh, the cartoonist kept bringing him back, and eventually he took over the entire uh, comic strip, and it became Popeye instead of Thimble Theater. And then, of course, when the cartoons came along, they just ignored the Thimble Theater <laughs> entirely and just made it Popeye cartoons. And Tim's point was that Krishna, in the early parts of the Mahabharata, is kind of nobody. Uh, you, you barely notice him. And then... Uh, as as the Mahabharata continues, he becomes more and more important, and finally it's revealed that he's God. So this is why uh, Tim thought that, uh, that uh, Krishna kind of resembled Popeye in that way, which I, I think is funny. So in that scene, Krishna is explaining the various things that he is to Arjuna. And let me read you one version of this. So this is probably the most concise version, and... Uh, Ramesh Balsakar's interpretation is slightly off from the standard, but close enough to the standard interpretation that we can just, uh, let's just go with that version. And so after, after uh, Krishna is telling Arjuna all the various things he is, one of the things he says is he is time. And he says, I am come as time, the ultimate waster of the people, ready for the hour that ripens to their doom. The warriors arrayed in hostile armies facing each other shall not live, whether you strike or stay your hand. So Arjuna is having uh, compunctions about killing all these people because they're his family, they're his friends. Uh, and this is what, uh, this is how. Uh, Krishna is replying, Therefore arise and fight, win kingdom, wealth, and glory, merely be the apparent instrument for their end. They have already been slain by me. O oh, ambidextrous bowman. So he has a bit different... Uh, this is Hindu literature. is full of this stuff. All Indian literature. It's like Russian literature where the characters never have just one name. They have like a dozen names. This makes it very confusing. But uh, here is Ramesh Balsakar's commentary. He says... 
Everything that is born or created must end. This is the law of nature, and in the process, human beings become the apparent reasons and instruments. In fact, they have nothing to do other than being mere instruments. They have no free will or choice. This is a big point that Ramesh Balsakar likes to make over and over again. His teacher, Nisargadatta Maharaj, doesn't really hammer that point as much as he does, so take that as you will. Anyway, let's continue. In this verse, Lord Krishna tells Arjuna that although Arjuna thinks in terms of himself being the killer and the enemies the ones he would kill, actually he, as time, has already killed them. There is no need for Arjuna to feel any regret. Arjuna's unhappiness stems from his feeling of personal doership, and here again the Lord reminds Arjuna that never can he be anything but an apparent instrument for anything that happens as part of the functioning of totality. In subtle terms, the Lord tells Arjuna not to question the functioning of totality, to enjoy the kingdom, wealth, and glory that is his, is his destiny, never forgetting that those two will be subject to the ultimate demolition and annihilation due to the efflux of time. Efflux, that's a funny word. I am time, says Krishna. That is to say, time is a concept as part of the concept of space-time, which came along with the manifestation on the arising of consciousness. For manifestation to happen, the concept of space is necessary for the objects to be constructed. Time is necessary for those manifested objects to be observed. In other words, space-time is a necessary adjunct of the manifestation as such, the manifestation being this world that we live in. So that's a that's a fairly standard interpretation. I, I In preparation for this video, I read uh, three or four different interpretations of that verse, and that seems to be pretty common. The Hare Krishnas, of course have a different interpretation because they take everything literally. So uh, it's kind of funny. because I always think the Hare Krishna is fascinating because their success is interesting because they approach Hindu scriptures the way fundamentalist uh, Christians in America approach Christianity. And so if it says, okay, so most people, people, most scholars who interpret the Bhagavad Gita kind of look at Arjuna as like the ego and Krishna as like the super ego and that the battle is life itself and the fact that the chariot is pulled by five horses represents the five senses and, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's a kind of, uh, an, um, it's seen as metaphorical. Well, the Hare Krishnas will say, no, it's not metaphorical. There was really five horses and there was really this guy and they it was really a battle and it's all literal and it all really happened and you got to believe it literally happened or else you're not going to do well in life and you're going to get a bad incarnation, which is kind of the same thing that the fundamentalist Christians say. You know, there was really a flood and there was really Jesus resurrected and none of it's metaphorical. It's all really happened. So it's, it's kind of fi fascinating. I think that's one of the reasons the Hare Krishnas have been so successful in America, because it's it kind of maps uh, straight on to fundamentalist Christianity. But there is another verse I should point out, verse 12, that uh, J. Robert, Amer J. Robert Oppenheimer apparently uh, also reflected on, although I don't know if he actually said it, uh, in uh, when the bomb went off, and let me read that one. Uh, it's verse 12 of chapter 11, same chapter. He says, uh, this is, uh, let's see, I guess this is the narrator saying this. If a thousand suns were to rise in the sky at the same time, each with a blazing effulgence, it might then resemble the wondrous wondrous radiance of that great being. That's uh, Krishna's universal form. So he, uh, he thought of that too. One last thing that I'll say about this story, which always disturbed me, and maybe I should do a whole video about this, but I'm just kind of tacking it on at the end, was, th and this is brought up in the film, and I've known about this for since I was a teenager and first read it somewhere, I don't remember, that the scientists who were working on the first atomic bomb, including Robert Oppenheimer, according to their calculations, there was a chance that when they set off the first atomic bomb, the chain reaction would be unstoppable and would ignite the entire atmosphere of planet Earth, thereby destroying all life on the planet. Now, 
this was a sort of minority opinion that this would actually happen and it was considered a low probability but nobody could say it wouldn't happen and just the arrogance of the scientists and the warmongers and the various people involved is just astonishing like to me the 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 fact that there was any chance at all of this happening would have meant no we do not ever explode an atomic weapon but this is how humans are and this is how we still are so when people say that certain things might have leaked out of a laboratory i kind of think yeah probably they did so uh you know uh, because we're constantly scientists are constantly playing with very very dangerous things and uh, that uh, that disturbs me a lot and I, i'm just gonna leave it at that but um it's actually one of the themes of my novel gill women of the prehistoric planet uh was uh, was this idea of of scientists playing with things that would uh, would destroy all humanity and it's also a, a key part of the book uh, cat's cradle by uh, by kurt vonnegut in which some scientists uh, discover a uh, a, a a sort of chemical process that will destroy all life on earth and they go ahead and make it anyway so there you go me and kurt vonnegut both worried about the same thing so all right if you want to contribute to me worrying more about science you can go to the url that you're seeing on the screen below which is hardcorezen.info slash donate that is hardcorezen dot info slash donate there you will find links to my paypal and patreon accounts those are my main and usually only ways of making a living and i appreciate your support but as always you don't got to support me if you don't want to i know i repeat this whole thing every video but it's actually really important to me and your your donations are very much appreciated because that is how i buy my groceries so uh we will see you next time have a good time all the time bye Hey Ziggy, what did you think of the Oppenheimer movie? You you sat and watched it with us, didn't you? What did you think about it? Do you have any opinion? Or you just don't want to say? Alright, we'll talk to you later. Bye Ziggy.